You're watching Cable 2. Good evening and welcome to the January 25th, 2022 Winston-Salem Forsyth County Board of Education meeting. I am Deanna Kaplan, board chair, and I appreciate your attendance and also say good evening to our viewers on cable two. Will you please rise as we start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Please let us pray. Tonight, as a board, please guide us in making the best decisions concerning our students and our staff. Please help us during this meeting to be kind to all and let us all work together as a team for the betterment of our school system. We ask in your name, amen. Amen, thank you. Our first order of business tonight is the agenda review. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as written? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Our next order of business is our special recognitions with our board spotlight video. January is National School Board Appreciation Month. On behalf of everyone in Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, we would like to thank the nine members of our school board for their service to our schools and our community. Deanna Kaplan was appointed chair by her fellow board members in December. Mrs. Kaplan and the rest of the Board of Education give their time and effort to collectively make the best decisions for Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. It's a responsibility they don't take lightly, and we are so thankful for everything they do. Service to others is what it's all about, really. And to be in this position and to really be able to make a difference um, in the lives of the children and, as I said, our educators, we are all in this together. And I'm just thrilled to be in a spot to be able to make some good decisions that will help move our community forward. Without the board and without their support, well, I would be nothing. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be in this position, so I'm honored for that but they all bring to the table, gosh, just such great diverse perspectives. They're all so intelligent and bright and everyone is different. And, and truly, I don't see politics, I see people. And we are all together in the best interest for our children. Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools is committed to keeping our students and our schools as safe as possible. And we are proud to introduce another tool in those efforts. In December, the district started using the Say Something Anonymous Reporting System. The program is an anonymous mobile tip application that teaches students, educators, and administrators how to recognize the signs and signals of those who may be at risk of hurting themselves or others, and then how to anonymously report this information. This Say Something Reporting System is designed to give us another tool uh, so that students, staff, or parents, or anybody else in the community for that matter, can communicate with us and give us information that they think that we need. The good thing about this is that we do have the ability to communicate back with them anonymously if they choose to speak with us. Since we went live in December, we have received 121 tips. You know, a lot of those were classified uh, as, as pranks or as, uh, you know, something that we didn't need to act on. Uh, but 12 of those were life safety emergencies, uh, which were handled, uh, were diverted to us and handled by the school. All middle and high school students have been trained on how to download and use the Say Something Anonymous Reporting System. 
This will now complement the bully patrol tip line already in use in our district and still being used by our elementary students. We had bully patrol here beforehand. It did almost every single thing with one exception. It didn't have real time communication with 911 and this does. It just gives us another uh, tool. You know, they got the phone in their hand already. They can report this on, by app. They can report it by phone. They can report it by uh, website. You know, whether it you, you know, saves one life or gives us the opportunity to uh, prevent something from happening, even if it's one time, then it, yeah, it's worth it. The 46th annual Frank Spencer Holiday Classic wrapped up on December 23rd, so let's throw the spotlight on the men's varsity high school basketball teams that walked away as this year's champions. In the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools Bracket Championship game, the third-seeded Winston-Salem Prep Phoenix knocked off South Stokes 80-62. It is the second time in school history that Winston-Salem Prep has earned a championship in the Frank Spencer Tournament. In the Pepsi Bracket Final, the fifth-seeded Glenn Bobcats defeated R.J. Reynolds 53-51 to take home the win. The victory marks the third time in school history that the Glenn Bobcats have won a championship in the Frank Spencer Holiday Classic Basketball Tournament. As we highlight our athletes, did you know that middle school athletes compete in 15 district sports for girls and boys? Seven sports have already completed their season for the year, so let's shine the spotlight on some county middle school champions. Congratulations to Kernersville Middle School as the Hawks won the softball championship. A shout out to the Clemens Middle School Cardinals who took home the trophy in baseball. How about the boys soccer team from Flat Rock Middle School? The Flat Rock Flyers won the soccer championship for the third year in a row. Congratulations to the girls cross country team at Wiley Middle School. The Wolverines celebrated winning the cross country championship. And Louisville Middle School brought home the trophy by winning the Boys Cross Country Championship. Congratulations to the Lions. Also, a shout out to the Hawks at Kernersville Middle School as they won the county championship in girls volleyball. And finally, congratulations to the Patriots at Jefferson Middle School as they won the championship in boys volleyball. We are proud of our middle school athletes' accomplishments and all of our district champions. It's a Friday morning and the atrium on the campus of the Career Center High School is packed with students who are in for a different type of learning experience. So come on down and play the casino games. Welcome to Career Center Casino. Good luck guys and let's have fun. It looked and felt like a real casino, but this casino is an experience, a class project for Gregory Fisher's Advanced Placement Statistics students who were tasked with creating an original game of chance. The lesson here is all about probabilities. The kids had to do a lot of figuring out the probability, making sure that the casino was still making money at the same time it was enticing for the kids. Oh, that's a dub. Give me okay. money. Yeah, so give me money. The chance of winning is like 30%. So, 40% chance of them winning and a 60% chance of them losing. The casino has to make a profit, so we have to have a slightly higher probability for us to win rather than for the players to win. I personally really like hands on projects and like making real world, real world connections, and this project definitely helped me like have fun understanding it, but also really understand the statistics behind it. Mr. Fisher puts a lot of time and effort into his class. Uh, there's a lot of fun games and interactions and simulations that we do, and it definitely teaches you what you need to know. Even though the wagers and the cash weren't real, the students' results varied. What didn't waver were the valuable lessons learned. You're going to be bankrupt, Emma. We made some money. They made some money, but we mostly we mostly walked away with most of that money. One, four, two, loser. Let's go. Today was pretty sick. I'm going to be honest. I've always liked like casino games and things like that, but getting to do it today, it showed me why the house always wins. Because seeing all the people lose my game, seeing all the L's on the board, it was really funny. What I really like about this is it, they got to they got to practice some of the math that they've done and they got to be engaged with it and they got to work with partners. So stuff like this really just gets kids excited to come out and like throw down some play money and just do some fun things. I think it was really good for everybody at the Career Center Day, not just Mr. Fisher students. And that is a look at this month's Board of Education Spotlight.
That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at this time, we will hear public comments on the potential names submitted for two of our facilities. It has been formally requested that our new maintenance facility be named after Reginald Teague. A formal request has also been submitted to name the R.J. Reynolds High School practice field after M. Douglas Crater. This is the public's time to formally comment on these requests. We will hear any comments tonight and informally vote on the naming suggestions at the next regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. And in looking, um, looking at the list, we don't have anyone um, that is signed up to speak. So at this time, we will hear public comments on the agenda items. The instructions for this section were on the sheet as you signed up. The most important rule to remember is that we ask that you be kind and respectful and know we cannot talk about sensitive and private student or personnel information in this public setting. You have three minutes to speak, and if you have more to share, always know you can email us directly. Um, we have one person signed up, and it's Peter Antonosi. Thank you. I guess if we're not talking about masks, not too many people show up. Um, so what I would like to talk about is, first of all, you know, the 16 million dollar math error from two weeks ago all taught us a lesson. When something presented at that podium does not smell right, the board, the superintendent, the community, we all have a responsibility to ask questions. So I have a few questions tonight on some agenda items. So on the agenda tonight, Dr. Pratt will present a $53,000 contract for professional development. My question to Dr. Pratt is, why does each professional development session cost over $4,000 a day? And why was this contract awarded to an institution in Seattle, Washington? We have four universities and colleges in our county. Were they asked to bid on the contract? Don't you think local education experts may have more insight than Seattle regarding our community's educational needs? One other thing. The contract bid prepared by the good old folks in Seattle had three math errors. And unfortunately, one math error carried over to the contract amount the board will vote on tonight. The board may want to fix that uh, before the vote. Also on tonight's agenda is the 2021 audit prepared by the accounting firm Dixon Hughes Goodman. In their presentation, revenues will be presented as dollars but expenditures are, pre are represented as percentages. So my question for Mr. Beatty is, can you tell us in dollars what was the total amount of expenses in fiscal year 2021? And can you provide a more detailed breakdown of expenses in dollars? The omission of a detailed expense report in an audit does not smell right. So I hope you will be adding a few more slides to your presentation tonight. But as it stands, on slide eight of this audit presentation, there is $33 million in excess revenue in 2021 compared to the prior year. What the $33 million was spent on is not documented in the Dixon Hughes Goodman presentation. How much of that $33 million excess revenue was used for maintenance, operations, professional development, and how much was used to increase teacher compensation. I have several more questions about this audit, and my hope is the board and the superintendent will have some questions too. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next order of business is the superintendent's update. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we can go ahead and, and move it to the next slide. So one of, I don't, I think everyone knew about these things, but I wanted to have a second to actually highlight um, some things related to we're all in this together that happened both in November and December. As you all know, last year we started we're all in this together as uh, a part of subbing in schools and that has continued. 
Um, and the subbing in schools is central office leaders going into schools and subbing. You heard earlier today that Kelly was doing that today. Um, and so that has continued. But this past November and into December, central office came together to figure out how could we continue working as a collective group to actually support our families and our students. And so at Thanksgiving time, you all probably saw a little bit about this, but this is some data around these initiatives that we've been doing. Um, we prepared Thanksgiving meal and activity kits um, for 363 families. And you can see the data. I'm not gonna read every part of this to you. Um, but our social workers were involved in identifying the families. You can see what the families received with the boxes of meals and the seasonal produce and also then all the activity kits. And um, so you can see everything on the right side of this slide shows the snacks that they received, additional activities. And that was, that was um, these items were given to families for that week of November when we were home for that week. Next slide. And then you can see on this slide, you can see some staff members actually passing, uh, uh, packing those baskets. And um, the, the, the best part about this giving back is that, there are, that we know that when you're giving to others, when you are um, doing for others, that also makes your, you feel better, that it is a actual, um, well, it's known to, to help your own social emotional well-being. And so basically, and mental health as well. And so this was a great, project for central office. You can see we made donations. We, we donated money and time. So we collected $5,600. And it was just a, a, big, a, a big initiative. And we were really excited about it. If you look at the next slide, these are all the partners that actually donated. So all of the produce you saw, the, 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 the food, the kits, everything. These are the groups that made um, all of that possible. All right. Then in Thanksgiving, in, in Chris, at Christmas time in December, we actually um, did another project. We actually did a giving tree was one of those things where we selected gifts off the tree and donated. But you can see 31 families were assisted. And you can see that data there. They received additional food items and baskets and, and activities you can see there. Next slide. Plus also. 130 students were adopted by central law staff members. And so those students, 130 individual students were given gifts um, to unwrap on Christmas Day. And we also collaborated with five community partners that you can see listed there. The other exciting part is we also worked with Salvation Army this year and 43 central office employees volunteered 90 hours at the Christmas warehouse to pack toys and gifts for, for children. Um, I know I spent an afternoon there myself, and it, it's just what an amazing operation. It was so much fun to actually go shopping. You're not spending any money, but you're shopping and you're picking stuff for a, 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 a child that's the right age. But I remember one of the bags that I packed, I could barely carry it across the floor. I was dragging it across. I'm like, this little guy is going to be really excited on Christmas Day. <laughs> but all of these things were just as it a, as a brought us together, and we want to continue more of that. We want to continue giving back. How do we give back to our students? How do we give back to our schools, help our schools do for our students? And so thank you to all of the teams, that all the people that participated. Um, this, you saw a video, if you, if you watched the video last week that was sent out, but thank you to our maintenance crews. From the, from the day after it snowed, when, you know, while we were trying to get ready to come back to school all last week, these guys and these women and men were out there every day just you know chipping away at getting the ice off of our ground so that we could return safely and so um, just a special thank you to all of our maintenance crews for the work that they did if you didn't get to see the video you've got to watch it um, as it's it, as they're showing you the, the the effort that it takes to clean that ice and as a person who this was my first experience with the snow then the ice the snow was awesome the ice not so much but the day that I went to drive to the office and the ice was like that thick on the window and um, it took me like 20 minutes, I was like, I'm, I should have made time, more time to get in my car and drive. Um, I remember that, that and then trying to actually um, chip away at the ice. I, after a few chips, I was like, okay, the, the sun's just gonna have to do its work because I can't do this. But anyway, um, so it, it really gave me just an, um, a, an appreciation for what these guys did to get our campuses ready and then custodians went back early and and made sure that you know sidewalks were clear and everybody so thanks to everybody for the work they did during the winter weather 
um, to make sure we were ready to come back this past Monday. And next slide. Something else. Um, so we are very excited. Our, our uh, staff has for years um, been part of raising money for scholarships uh, through UNCF. And I think back, and it may have started before this, but what I do know is that um, Dr. Symington, who was, who was here and as superintendent for a period of time in and, and, and student services, was really the person behind U UNCF. Well, we've continued that. And we're really excited because the funds that were raised in the last uh, year, um, we are actually, we did not give a scholarship last year. So for the funds, ra funds raised last year, we're going back to any of our recent 2021 graduates who are currently enrolled as a freshman in an accredited four-year college university um, in North Carolina may be eligible to apply. So this is exciting. And to let you know, we are kicking off this year's UNCF. I hope everyone participa will participate. And we will be giving out scholarships um, at the end of this school year. So another important, um, important uh, uh, initiative for us to be part of. And last but not least, thank you so much to our Board of Education uh, for the time you give. Um, it, uh, what, is, what is not supposed to be a full-time job, I think really becomes one when you're on a board, a school board. And so we just thank you all for being here and, and for just making great decisions on behalf of our staff and our students. And I think just so that everyone else can see, um, Elizabeth, can, uh, Board Member Motzinger, can you show your cutting board? It's underneath all your stuff. So we have a special, a special gift to each of you. And you can see it. It says um, uh, WFCS, Board of Education, and it has their name and the year. And um, it says, no matter how you slice it, you are the best. So <laughs> thank you all very much um, for your service to Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our next order of business is the discussion items. And first is the 2021 fiscal audit report from Dixon Hughes Goodman, LLP, presented by Tyler Beatty, the CPA senior manager. All righty. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be with you guys tonight. My name is Tyler Beatty, and I'm a managing director with Dixon Hughes Goodman. We were the firm engaged to perform the financial statement and compliance audit for Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools as of June 30th, 2021. I'd like to start out the presentation by thanking Andrea and her entire team for the help they provided during this year's audit. I would also like to note that the LGC has accepted the audit, and it has also been accepted by the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through our audit deliverables, which are in front of you. They include the financial statements, which is the launcher document, and our required communications report to the board. We'll also do a quick review of the compliance audit and review some of the financial highlights. So first, all of the hard work that everyone contributes to the audit is primarily to enable us to issue an opinion on the financial statements. Starting on page one of the financial statements, you'll note that the independent auditor's report gives an unmodified opinion. This is the opinion you want to receive as a board, and it gives financial statement users an indication that the information is materially accurate in the financial statements. Next, we'll review the communication report, which again is the smaller attachment. So there are various parts of the audit process that we're required to communicate to the board. The first is any significant estimates or sensitive disclosures that are included in the financial statements. We've identified as these being the useful lives of depreciable assets, the proportionate share of the net pension liability for the TSERS plan and the OPEB liabilities related to the RBHF plan and the disability income plan of North Carolina. If there were any difficulties or disagreements we had during the audit, those difficulties or disagreements would be communicated to you in this report. I'm pleased to report that we didn't have any difficulties or dif disagreements with management during the course of our audit. Um, uncorrected misstatements. So if we identified a misstatement during our audit procedures and asked management to make the, the correction and it wasn't corrected, those identified uncorrected misstatements would be communicated in this report. Again, pleased to announce that there were no uncorrected misstatements as part of the audit. 
And then finally, uh, in the appendix is the management representation letters included. Uh, we've attached this letter, which was assigned by management. It's, it's attached to this report, so you can see what representations were giving us during the course of the audit. All right, next. So as part of our presentation, um, instead of having you thumb through the financial highlight, or the, the entire financial statements, which is 81 pages, and I would keep you here all night, um, what we tried to do is pull out the relevant information um, in the financial statements to go over to you, go over with you. Um, I guess I should note um, that expenditures are included in your financial statements, which is public. It's actually reported on three different bases of accounting. So you have your full accrual expenditures, which is in Exhibit 2. And so these are a full accrual statement similar to what would be provided by a business um, or a for-profit company. Next, you have your modified accrual expenditures, which doesn't include long-term assets or long-term disabilities. And those are presented by fund by purpose on Exhibit 4 of the financial statements. On the last page of Exhibit 4, there's a reconciliation between the expenditures reported on the modified accrual statements as, and compared to the expenditures reported on the full accrual statements. And then lastly, in your supporting schedules, you have budgetary schedules, which include encumbrances, which again is a different basis of accounting than the modified accrual statements. And those expenditures are compared to the budget to show any budget to actual variances in fiscal year 2021. So our first slide is the general and special revenue funds, which are your fund two and fund eight revenues, which is the orange bar on the very left of the graph. Um, your state public school fund revenues, which again is the blue bar in the middle, and obviously the largest funding source of the board. And then on the very right is your federal revenues realized in fund three, which is the light blue bar. So your general and restricted funding, which again is your fund two and fund eight funding, it was around $153 million in fiscal year 2021. It was an increase of approximately 10.5 million when compared to the prior year. This increase is primarily due to an increase in county appropriations received in fiscal year 2021 of approximately 9.7 million. Um, your state funding, which is obviously the largest funding source of the board, the increase was approximately $6.8 million when compared to the prior year. Of this $6.8 million benefit expense paid to employees, which is your object code 200 expenditures, it increased $4 million in 2021 when compared to 2020. So the, re the retirement benefit rate in 2021 actually increased to 21.68% compared to 19.7% in fiscal year 2020. So this is the employer contribution rate for retirement and related benefits as a percentage of covered salaries for eligible employees. And then lastly, the state public school fund is a balanced fund, meaning each year revenues match expenditures. So there's no excess expenditures or revenues for each fiscal year. For federal funding, so again, this is your fund three funding, it increased $15.7 million um, in fiscal year 2021, and almost all of that was related to the education stabilization money, which is a federal program that the board received in fiscal year 2021 that wasn't received in 2020. In 2021, it, the board received $11.4 million as part of the ESF in 2021. And then lastly, there's an entire schedule of federal and state awards um, that details all the federal and state programs that the board received in fiscal year 2021, and that, that schedule can be, shown, can be seen on page 79 of the financial statements. Lastly, this slide gives you a really good representation of how much the board relies on state funding, and this is one of the primary reasons it's hard to budget for a fiscal year until the state allocation and state budget's finalized. Our next slide, so, what we do here, instead of presenting total expenditures by fund, by purpose, which would lead to a 25-page just expenditure presentation, the way we like to do it is we like to benchmark it and look at total expenditures expended in the current year for your instructional services, which is your 5,000 purpose codes. And then what we like to do is look at support services, which is your 6,000 above DPI purpose codes. And so what we're doing when we look at the schedule is we're trying to look for any volatility or changes from year to year 
and we also compare it to our peer LEAs to see and ensure that as much expenditures as possible is being spent on instructional services. So obviously, as this slide indicates, you've consistently spent around 84% of dollars um, on instructional services with the remaining 16% going to support services. Just to reiterate, we would expect consistency from year to year in the slide, or in this ratio, which this slide indicates. All right, next. So next slide, um, it details your fund balances for your general and restricted revenue fund um, for this year and the prior two year. So in 2021, obviously, there was a significant increase of $11.5 million in fund two and fund eight for this year. And this was consistent with all of our other LEA clients. And it suggests that the board was able to utilize the additional and federal state funding related to COVID-19 that was received in fiscal year 21 throughout the year that wasn't anticipated at the beginning of the fiscal year. So your difference between your total fund balance, which is the blue bar on the very left, and your orange, which is available for appropriation, that difference is related to certain restrictions that you have to reserve for fund balance, and it includes a $1.1 million restriction for your inventory balances and a $7.9 million restriction for stabilization of state statute. So restricted amounts in the current fiscal year has increased due to outstanding encumbrances in the general fund, and these restricted amounts have to be set aside and they're unable to be assigned for fund balance. And then lastly, the unassigned fund balance, which is the blue bar on the very right, you'll actually notice that your unassigned fund balance as of June 30th, 2021, decreased when compared to the prior year. And this is a due to additional signed amounts that was appropriated for the fiscal year 2022 budget. So it was, the money was already set aside, which indicated a decrease in the undersigned in 21 compared to 20. So the board's entire breakdown of fund balance by fund can be found on page 14 of the financial statements. And as noted, but just to reiterate, almost all of our LEAs noted an increase in general fund fund balance in fiscal year 2021 because of the additional federal and state funding. We believe that boards should continue to remain conservative and strategically decide when to utilize fund balance. Um, fund balance should primarily be used for one-time expenditures. We believe that the cost of education will continue to rise and the support related to the COVID-19 programs is eventually gonna expire. Lastly, we have a snapshot of the School Nutrition Service Fund. So cash decreased right around $456,000 when compared to the prior year, and this is primarily related to the net loss of $700,000 related to the School Food Service Fund. Operating revenues decreased $7.5 million, which was due, due to decreases in federal revenues, as well as food sales because of the summer food feeding program. The liabilities on your child nutrition fund are primarily related to long-term pension and OPEB liabilities. And it should be noted that, again, most of our LEA clients notice decreases um, in net position for the school food service fund this year because of the substantial decrease in food sales and operating revenues. So next we'll talk briefly about our compliance audit. So as part of government auditing, auditing standards, we're required to evaluate the board's compliance with laws, regulations, contracts, and agreements such as grant agreements. Included in the financial statements is what's known as our yellow book report and summarizes the results of this. We didn't have any reportable findings which were required to be reported in accordance with those standards. Next, we're also required to evaluate the board's compliance with federal programs that are deemed to be major. For fiscal year 2021, we noted the Education Stabilization Fund, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, Supporting ex Effective Instruction, Student Support and Academic Enrichment, and the Child Nutrition Cluster Programs, which were considered to be major and required to be audited. In fiscal year 2021, the Office of Management and Budget identified the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the Education Stabilization Fund as high risk. This means we were required to audit these programs regardless of our internal risk assessment. We do expect the Office of Management and Budget to continue to identify COVID-19 programs as high risk, which means they'll most likely be subject to major program testing in future audits. 
we had no reportable findings related to the compliance audits of these federal programs for fiscal year 2021. Lastly, we were required to evaluate the board's compliance with state programs that are deemed to be major. In fiscal year 2021, we noted four programs which were considered major and required to be audited. That was the state public school fund, which is required to be audited every year, driver training, voc ed state months of employment, and voc ed program support funds. There were no reportable findings, again, related to this compliant audit. And then lastly, we do have a significant accounting standard um, for the board that is going to be effective was actually effective July 1, 2021, but will impact this report um, for the June 30th, 2022 audit. It is Gatsby 87 leases. Um, and what is primarily gonna have an impact is on your full, full accrual schedules, which is your exhibit one and exhibit two. And it's gonna require you to assess your leases and record a lease asset and a lease liability. So, that sums up my presentation. I'm happy to go over any questions that the board may have. Board member Bohannon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Betty. I have a, a few questions. Um, first on, and if you, on page 16 of the, um, the big book, the, re the, the reporting book. Yep. Um, there are, I think there are like the function levels where you under expenditure. So you have instructional services and then all of the other categories. Do we, do we as a district set those or are those standard? That may be a question for Ms. Gillis. I'm no, sure. you know, that's a great question. It's mandated by the state uh, DPI. So okay. you, we, we typically show these schedules at a, um, I think the, the technical term is the functional budgetary level of control. Um, but if you pulled every single audit for the LEAs, they would be set at your purpose code. So, Obviously, regular instructionals, 5,100, 5,200, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and, I, and I guess I should add, too, just to clarify, um, the LGC, the Local Government Commission, they put out a sample financial statement. Um, it's on the LGC State Treasurer website. So these financial statements conform to the sample financial statements that's issued by the Local Government Commission. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. And so then sort of transitioning to the... Um, it, it's in here, but it's also in the slides that sort of breaks down our funding and where it comes from. So all of our state funds and our federal funds, would those be considered restricted funds or? Yeah, good question. So your, your federal funding and your state public school funding, they're actually balanced funds. Um, so they're actually recorded in a governmental fund called a special revenue fund. But you'll notice if you look at exhibit four and actually flip to page two of three, you'll notice that the non-major fund, which is fund three in your state public school fund, it doesn't carry an access of any revenues or expenditures. So effectively what happens is DPI pulls back any access amounts that wasn't spent. So when you look at this from a modified accrual basis, your revenues and expenditures are always gonna match. And where I'm going with this is since you don't carry a fund balance in fund three, which is your federal fund or fund one, there's not really any restricted fund balance because it doesn't carry any fund balance. Okay, um, thank you. And then um, how long has Dixon Hughes Goodman been providing this district with auditing services? Yeah, great question. So I've served Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools for since June of 2018. Um, I'm not, not sure how long the firm has served Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools, but we can definitely find that information. Um, what I'll mention and reiterate is we do turn over our audit team pretty consistently. So for the fiscal year 2021 audit, our staff, um, our associates and our senior, associate, senior associates, um, we're new to the engagement this year. Um, in addition to that, we always perform unpredictable um, procedures. So we're not performing the same procedures year over year. Um, lastly, the other thing I'll mention is we do receive general ledger details from the finance department as part of our audit procedures and we roll every single journal entry that was made from the prior year to the current year. And then we sub subject that to data analytics and based on risk, we'll pull journal entries and other things like that to, to test. Okay, I think I heard board member Parker say that we've had Dixon Hughes from her for as long as she's, she can remember. So it's been, that must, that's a, a long time. Not, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> 
I am so sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and then my last question, so the previous, I know that, so there were no findings um, in this audit, but I know that previously in a few years there, there have been findings previously. How does this, this audit just overall compare to previous years and, and sort of just generally speaking? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the formal answer would be is like our conclusions are included in this year's audit report and you can definitely go back and look at the pervasiveness of the findings that were issued in the prior audit report. Um, I can tell you that our, that our release date was significantly earlier this year. Um, you know, typically we have to have the financial statements done by October 30th. You can go back and look at the opinion dates in the audits and typically the earlier that opinion date is, is indicative of how the audit process went. Um, from my perspective, you know, the, there were certain things in the 2020 audit in, in, in the form of material weaknesses, which a, a finding that's a material weakness would indicate there's control deficiencies that could that could lead to a material error if they weren't cor weren't corrected, such as timeliness of bank reconciliations, um, procedures and other internal controls, preventive and detective controls. Those were all corrected um, for the fiscal year 2021 audit, which is why we're not reporting any deficiencies that we thought was significant or material. So Ms. Gillis, I guess that sounds like you and your team did a fantastic job. So thank yeah. you so much. Any more questions? No, I, I would just like to uh, piggyback with uh, Board Member Bohannon that you know, during my eight years on the board, this is the first time we've um, been been on time, um, and most of the time we are you know right up to the gate or, 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 or delayed from from turning over the material to the to the auditors. And the first time in those eight years that we've had no findings, and so I think that speaks volumes to to our CFO mm -hmm. who who came in and straightened out a lot of things that were that were wrong and uh, I know she's she's got still plans and things she wants to do to make us even better but thank you so much Andrea um, for your leadership and for all the things that you're doing in our finance department absolutely um, I, I have one um, on page 75 it says auditee qualified as low-risk Oddity, and the answer was no. What, what does that? Perfect. Yeah, great question. So, um, I guess the technical answer again is it, this is dictated by the uniform guidance. So, if there were certain criteria that was hit in a prior year audit, um, we have to go through that waterfall of analysis to determine it, for this year's audit does the reporting entity, in this case, Winston Salem Forsyth County Board of Education qualifies a low risk oddity or a high risk oddity. If it's low risk, we're only required to look at 20% of your total federal expenditures. If it's high risk, we have to look at 40% of your total federal okay. expenditures. So among other things, because there was a material weakness issued in the June 30th, 2020 financial statement audit, the board didn't qualify as a low risk oddity for fiscal year 2021 because of those prior year findings. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you again. <laughs> Excellent. Next up is the 2022-2023 Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Academic Calendar presented by Dr. Jesse Pratt, our Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, Board Chair Kaplan, um, school board members and Superintendent McManus. I'm here this, th um, this evening to share with you the proposed 2022-2023 school calendar. Uh, before we start in on reviewing the calendars, just wanted to share with the board the process we use to create the calendars that we have today. Uh, we started back in November where we created a district calendar committee that was made up of district office staff, um, principals, assistant principals, classified personnel within the district. That 14 member committee created calendar A um, that's in your packet um, today, this evening. We then took that calendar and presented it to the superintendent team for feedback. We got feedback from the superintendent team, took that feedback to the uh, teacher advisory count, um, council, 
where selective members reviewed the calendar and provided feedback as well. We shared the calendar with uh, Forsyth Principal Association uh, for feedback and, and suggestion. Once we received all that feedback, we did survey all employees, about 1,635 responses on calendar A. I took that feedback to the superintendent team where we then took that feedback and created calendar B um, in the district. Once we created calendar B, we signed both, um, we, we surveyed um, all personnel, employees in the district on which calendar that um, they preferred. We had about 1,880 um, participants on the calendar review. So just as we did, as we formed the district calendar committee, just a couple of rules of the calendar. We follow the state requirements when we, create it, when we create a calendar in the district. Um, that is um, law 115C.84.2. Um, it's linked in the presentation if you want to review it. But as a district, we have to make a calendar of 215 staff days. Um, we can, um, in that calendar, we cannot have te um, teachers or 10 month employees working more than 195 days. We must include 11 holidays in the calendar and a minimum of 10 annual leave days. Our calendar needed to be 185 instructional days or 1,025 instructional hours. The rules in um, the state law says that we cannot start school, um, we cannot start school um, before the Monday closest, we have to start school Monday, the Monday closest to August 26. Um, it's the early that we can start. And so on this year's calendar, that's Monday, August 29th. We must end school no later than Friday, closest to June 11th, which is June 9th. This year is the last year that we can use remote learning days for any kind of weather um, that we may have to close school for. So that um, allowance runs as far as June 30, 2022. Calendar A was created um, here. Um, we, um, we signed that calendar out for review. That calendar is also in the packet so you can take a look at it. Um, but we follow the guidelines that I shared with you um, earlier. Some of the feedback that we received from calendar A, um, around four buckets. Um, the first bucket was the start time. Um, staff really wanted to start earlier than August 29th and they prefer to start earlier in August so that we can end the semester earlier, early. The number of work days at the start of school, some staff members were concerned that they didn't really need seven, they only needed um, five days um, in the, in, on the calendar. They also made some suggestions around winter break and first semester. Um, most of the comments came around um, needing more time for winter break instead of um, the week off for Thanksgiving. Staff stressed that they would like to have exams before winter break and they needed a work day in September and October. Spring break, uh, several comments about having spring break earlier, maybe in March instead of around Easter. And then the end date to end early if we start school earlier in August and only needing two work days at the end of the school year. We created calendar B based on that feedback. That's also in your packet for review. So um, calendar A and calendar B on um, the comparison here, we needed, um, we have 177 instructional days in calendar A, 17 work days that would give us 194 days. And then we had to add the 21 days for holidays and leave days that gave us 215 days in calendar A. Calendar B had a, has 176 days with 18 work days. Um, and then we add the holidays and the leave days would give us the 215 days. So you can see we're meeting the requirement of no more than 195 days for um, 10 month employees. And then when we add the holidays and the leave days, we're at the 215 days that's required by the state. The difference between calendar A and B in calendar A, they have a, we have 177 instructional days compared to calendar B is 176 instructional days. 
calendar A has 91 days in first semester and calendar B has 90 days in, um, in first semester. There's 17 work days in calendar A and 18 work days in calendar B. The biggest difference between calendar A and B, there's five work days um, for Thanksgiving. So teachers basically have the week off for Thanksgiving. And then in calendar B, there's only three days off where we come to school Monday, and Tuesday, and then we're off Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Calendar A has eight days for winter break and then 11 days for winter break in calendar B. So we try to take the feedback from um, employees and adjust the calendar and create a calendar B um, for staff. We also have in our packets Inspire 340. Inspire 340 schools get five additional days. I think Ms. Hale shared that in her ESSA dollars where we pay for those five additional days. So you can see instead of 215 days on this calendar, we have five additional days, 220 days. Three days are added at the beginning of August and two days is added at the end of June, which makes them 222 days. We also have an exception for early and middle college um, calendars. Um, they start early in August. That calendar is also in um, the packet for your review. They have 177 instructional days with 17 work days, a total of 194 days for 10 month employees. Then we add the 21 days for holidays and leave. That gives us 215 days for that calendar as well. We also are required by law to identify makeup days within our calendar. So for the make, we have selected October the 31st, June 3rd, February the 20th, and March 31st. Um, 31st as our makeup days if we miss any school and we have to make up any days of, of, of instructional time. So we signed calendar A and B out to solicit feedback from staff. Uh, we had about 68% of people of teachers that responded to the survey and about 20% um, was school-based support staff and so on. So the majority um, of the feedback we got were, were teachers within the district. Uh, most of those teachers were elementary teachers at 54%. We had about 19% middle school teachers, 20% L, um, high school, and about 8% that taught all three grade levels. We had 1,880 response, as I said earlier. 85% um, of those chose calendar B for their calendar for next school year. Questions from the board? or discussion around the calendar proposals. Did, any questions? Um, or when, recommendations? When, when, do we, when are we going to get parent feedback? So we have not um, re, uh, received any parent feedback at this point. So once um, you guys give us feedback on the calendars proposed, we'll send those out for parents to, um, have, to receive feedback. Put the, could you put the calendars? back up real quick yeah just can you put calendar B yes please yeah now if you will open up the attachment so we can see the whole yeah <laughs> yes calendar B We have in our packet. That's fine. So I, I think there it is. While we're trying to find it, I, I was okay. just going to say I, I think we I know we had a workshop and we really talked about that. And I think Board Member Crowley brought up a really good point about mm -hmm. changing the the date yeah. around. It was the spring break. It was the spring Looking break. at so that we didn't have four days of instruction and then take a week off into that last quarter. That's right. If we could flip flip the weeks. For that, so that that I think staff was waiting. Says yeah, right. I think staff was waiting on us to make that recommendation for, that, for right. a change. And if we could, I think we we talked about if we could make that recommendation to the calendar before we send it out for the parents. Correct. Parental feedback. Correct. Great. So, yeah. So the recommendation, if I'm hearing clearly, is to yes. move spring break 
to the first week of um, April in order to have some cut, um, not to have a break right before we start third, the fourth quarter. Correct. Um, so spring break will become the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth of April, along with the 10th of April. Yes, and that, I mean, that still gives, and so just for, you know, I think if, if parents have, or, or, or staff have already made plans around that, that Easter break, that gives them that week off before um, Good Friday, and then they still have um, off on the Monday. Right, and that, that also on the 31st is the work day, so then they'll leave that work day, go right into spring break as well. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. So that, that will start the, the last quarter when they come back. Right, that will start the last quarter on April 11th. Okay, and Dr. Pratt, can you explain about the, the days that are circled, the early release days, what will happen What's the plan for those days? So we're, we're in the process of working with um, instructional services to kind of outline what we're going to, the expectations around early release day. I know that that was a lot of feedback from teachers on the survey calendar as well. What's the purpose of those days? How will they be utilized, et cetera? And so we want to work closely with instructional services and the area superintendents to be very clear about what's expected on early release days. So we'll, we'll, we'll have that communication out to staff after we um, meet as a team. And how will we um, designate when we are uh, putting this calendar out to, to families? Are we gonna put, I think it's important that we mark those days with something. It used to be snowflakes a long time ago, right. but with something so that parents, it you know sends a message out to them, this is a special day that could be used as a makeup day so that they don't make plans for and, and you know as well staff. yes ma'am and we'll, we will follow that protocol that's been used previously in the past okay and one other thing too yes, we, we talked about designating the graduation days so that parents of seniors know well in advance when graduation <laughs> will be and can make the plans accordingly Yes, and so we're in the process now of talking to our vendor about graduation dates um, for next school year. So it really depends on the venue that we use. Um, and so we like to secure their um, commitment to those dates before we share them. Yeah. But we try to be very consistent over the last, the last Friday and the weekend um, for graduation if we can get those dates from our vendor. Any other questions? Thank you. And while you're up, um, so, if you could also present the professional development contract with the University of Washington Center for Educational Leadership. Yes. So this is a great opportunity as we began the work um, last school year to kind of restructure our district um, to focus on equity-centered leadership. We hired four new, uh, five new area superintendents within our district. Um, we want to take this opportunity to participate in some professional development to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our principals each and every day. Um, and that means that we're really thinking in an equity-centered mindset as we support them, as they support teachers and students within the building. So this is a job-embedded professional development. Uh, University of Washington will come to us. They will meet with central office staff. They will, um, clearly, they will help us clearly define the roles of the area superintendents within the district and how they work as work to support principals to remove barriers to get the work, to get the job they need to get done within their buildings. Um, they will also have one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching opportunities with the area superintendent and myself around their work and how we're supporting principals to be those equity-centered leaders that we need them to be in the district. I can tell you there's um, over the last probably eight or nine years or so, there has not been a lot of focus on principal supervisors. A lot of districts promote um, people to be principal supervisors, but really do not provide them professional development and training. So as we're uh, moving forward in this new structure within the district, we just want to make sure that we have the latest tools and resources to support our principals to get great to get the great work um, done in their school buildings, and so this professional development will give us that opportunity. 
It also will give us an opportunity, we're all coming from different backgrounds, to begin developing common language around how we're coaching our principals and supporting our principals within the district. So each one of us have different tools in our tool belt that we use with principals. But we need to, have, we need to be very consistent as we work with our principals in this district. So having this professional development will also assist us in developing those common language, those common expectations, those protocols, those procedures that we need to be successful in supporting principals. Because we know the number one person to affect achievement in the, in the school building is the teacher. If, but if you don't have an effective principal leading that work and supporting teachers, we're not gonna make the, the necessary moves and gains that we need as a district. So we're very committed to being those instructional, supporting those instructional leaders within our building, and we want to make sure that we have the tools to do that. So that's the professional development that we are participating in. And I know we had a speaker earlier, there is a math mistake in the quote, um, and I think because we're going back and forth with the University of Washington around um, the number of books or materials that we need, we thought we needed 10, we thought we needed 15, then we went back here, I think the, the quote from the University of Washington just got mixed up in the many different versions that we've had. Um, and so that's the biggest difference in the difference of the quote. The quote is actually $53,190, but the quote, what we're asking on the um, contract is $53,200, it's a difference of $10. And so we won't pay no more than what, they, what we need to pay them. And um, I talked to them the other day, we're paying the $53,190 because that's what's there. And they understand that. Thank you. Uh, You're uh, welcome. Yes. Dr. Pratt, is, is there anyone uh, in this area that does the same thing that uh, the group that we are talking with right now does? Right. Or is it just a special field that you know, we need the group that would be coming in? It is a special field, but we looked at a variety of people when we looked at this. Um, we had several vendors, we researched several vendors um, who provide this, this work, and then we selected two that came in and actually spoke to us. Um, one is out of Charlotte, North Carolina, Queens University, and, and the University of Washington. But we looked at new leaders, we looked at a variety of organizations. Um, they made presentations to the, uh, the area superintendents and myself, and then the area superintendents and I had a discussion about which vendor we thought would meet our needs as leaders um, in the district and leading the work with principals. And we selected 100% the University of Washington to meet those needs. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. You're I welcome. that would be good for the public to know also. <clears throat> yeah, how, you, how you're how welcome. And if we had someone local, we would have reached out to them, but we, it's just no one no, local who is an expert in this particular gotcha. um, training that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Board Member Crowley. Yes, I, I noticed in the contract that it said that what would help inform the work is self-assessments by mm -hmm. the principal supervisors. Mm -hmm. And then it said that one of the ways it would deem that this um, exercise had been effective was through principal surveys. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to if principal surveys would be used up front to help inform what the work should be instead of just self-assessments. Yeah, that's a great question. We can have a dialogue around them. I know that we are currently having, uh, we're, they just completed 360. All senior staff just completed a 360 um, tool as well. So we can use some of that. Some of the area superintendents might have some um, that um, tool to their principal as well. So we can look into doing some of that. I'll, we'll have a conversation with them. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Pratt. Uh -huh. um, actually, I think this um, question is for the superintendent. I did see in an email that you have some experience with this group, and since um, technically you're tasked with making sure our district move forward, you know, I'm very interested in your feedback around your experience working with this group. Yeah, so, so to Dr. Pratt's point, and to reiterate what he said about the, the work around principals and the work around principal supervision has really taken off quite heavily in, the, in about the last 10 years, 10, 10, 12 years. Principal supervision is newer. Well, University of Washington, we're on the front end of, of starting research and work around this. If anyone has ever looked into central office transformation, um, which is work by Meredith Honig, 
she was with University of Washington Cell. And so what they did is they weren't just focused on the principalship, they went to, if they need to be quality, what about the people supporting them? And if they need to be quality, what is the rest of central office doing to make sure we're breaking down barriers, not adding barriers to the work that principals have to do in their buildings? And so University of Washington were the first folks to actually like move forward on the work of principal supervision. So we did, I did use them in a district I was in prior. They did amazing work. The, 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 the beauty of what they do is the job embedded piece. So they go out into the field with the area superintendents. They come and they meet with central office. They meet with principals. They get a really strong perspective. Other folks ha learn from all of that. And so like fo people learn from all that and then they offer other iterations of training. And so that's, I mean, everyone does that. But they really were the leaders in this work. And um, they have a research base behind their work, which makes it really, really strong. And again, there's lots of folks in the area that focus on principal development and future principal development, but not around the folks that actually do the work of developing principals um, and the central office transformation, which is a huge part of this. I encourage everyone to, to, to read, I mean, the, the information out there on central, uh, central office transformation by Meredith Honig. So thanks for asking. I'm excited about this contract. We hired an amazing team and to be able to just get them all together and unified around a common language and framework for coaching principles is gonna be really powerful for us. Yes, ma'am. The board. question oh, is when you sorry. say they when, mm -hmm. and talk about a team yeah. visit, how many people is they? On, with the, that team? are on University of Central, I mean, that are with, no, the, we'll with their team? I yeah. don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure who they're, so who they're sending in. Who it could be up to two people that may be, um, one that will work directly with us at all time, and then we'll have an advisor as well. On the visit, it's one. It's one. Mm -hmm. But when we do the content sections, that could possibly be up to two. Board member Bohannon. Thank you. Um, so will this be paid for through the Wallace Grant, with the Wallace Grant funds, or through its local funds? Right now, we're proposing to use local funds. Okay. Um, but if we can find some other funding sources, we'll, we'll look into that as well. OK. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, that was, yeah, that was my initial thought. But I, right. so I, I want to. Um, I understand the sort of. I am certainly sensitive to the to the need for continuous improvement, and mm -hmm. I think that I've heard really good things. I know that um, this firm has worked with uh, worked in Charlotte Mac, um, lots of other places, and I think that they can do some really good work. I, I just we have this board has heard lots of feedback over the past. Well, I'll speak for me. I have heard lots of feedback around, you know professional development in sort of kind of this like atmosphere of that right now um, we just you know everybody is working kind of tooth and nail to get stuff done and people are working extremely hard and some people I think especially within central office because we talk a lot about what's happening in our buildings but I think our folks in central office ha are working extremely hard and I want to just make sure that when we identify a need for this type of professional development what, what we're doing is really, really concentrating on the fact that we, everybody should be committed to continuous improvement no matter mm -hmm. what. And what we're not doing is, is communicating or, or, or sending a message that, you know, what was done previously was just not it, right? We just are a part of trying to always improve. And I, I don't That's want right. anyone to feel like um, I don't want anyone who's working in central office or who has been a part of this district for quite some time to feel slighted by the fact that we just are moving in a different direction and we want to make sure that everyone is valued no matter who we use or utilize right. for professional development. So Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it is a different philosophy. We, we strongly believe in a cycle of continuous improvement. That may not be in the situation um, with um, previous administration or whoever. I don't, I, I'm not sure. but. It, it is something that I feel like is extremely important as we move forward to improve our craft as educators. I mean, I, I always, my philosophy even as a principal in, in, in a school is if we're not learning as an adult, then our kids are not learning. Yeah. And so it's a cycle that we must constantly be engaged in um, to improve our crafts as, as educators. And I, I don't want to slight anything that's done in the past we're all, I'm new here, I think area superintendent's new here. We just want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of what we're dealing with currently 
um, in the district. Yeah. Um, and so I don't want to offend anyone or to say something I shouldn't say, but I, I just feel like strongly that we need to be in the process of continuous learning as we encourage our principals to be there. And then I had one more question. So within the, 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 the content of the, in, in the assembly page, it said that there were, it was gonna include principal supervisors and select executive directors. Have Correct. those select executive directors been identified? So they used the term um, um, executive directors, um, but it's really our superintendent team. Okay. Um, and so that's who they're talking about, assistant superintendents. We're actually gonna do a retreat, two days retreat in February. That's gonna be the kickoff of it. And so when they say executive directors, they're talking about the superintendent team. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I just need to speak up on the history of the district because we were one of the first districts doing professional learning communities and involved in systems thinking work and that there has been an enormous history in this district of people trying to improve against difficult odds. And I have yeah. to speak up for our longstanding staff because they have worked really hard to get better and better over all the years I've served. Right. Yeah. And I, again, I apologize. I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm talking about principal supervisors and the professional development for them as they're coming in and doing the work, yeah. not with teachers and things of that nature, but our current positions that we in board member in the professional development. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to piggyback on that, I think that um, we do have a lot. I mean, almost all mm -hmm. new, um, uh, you know, administrative staff are, are people who are supervising so I think it's going to be very important I think you alluded to that when you mm -hmm. were speaking that it's going to be important they all have different they've come from different districts with different philosophies different methods different right. everything and so I think it'll be a good way for you guys to to bond to to see to you know uh, learn from each other as well Right. Um, and I also would encourage you, um, because as I said up here, and, and, and this nice young gentleman just reminded <laughs> everyone of that, that, that there's a lot of history here right. in this district. And I think it is important that, um, and that that's going away. I mean, it's going to walk out the door, um, some of it, and a lot of it, it, people in central office, some folks up here. Um, and so I think it's going to be, that may be a, a part mm -hmm. of what you maybe delve into. I don't know how much of that they do or whether you all want to do that on your own um, as, a, as a sidebar uh, with some of your things. But I think it's important you learn from history. That's right. Um, and the good and the bad mm -hmm. and what to repeat, what maybe is helpful and all that. So I would just encourage um, you guys whenever you're doing um, these intentional things, um, to move forward for that, you know, to be a part of um, a, a part of our agenda tonight was a wonderful man, Reginald Teague, and uh, mm -hmm. and the things that he brought to this district and the things that, you know, that that we went through during his time. I mean, there's just a lot of history, and I would encourage you, um, you guys, to as well, to explore that as, at at some point too. So yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. That's the old gray-haired lady talking. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank All you right, so thank much you. for both presentations. Uh, the next order of business is the action items. Um, I'd like to consider approval of the professional development contract with the University of Washington. Do I have a motion? Move Someone approval. A second. second. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Uh, next is to consider approval of the ESSER funded recognition and retention bonuses. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, next is to consider approval of the custodial contract agreement, the extension and addendum for the Bud Group and Supreme Maintenance Organization. Do I have a motion? So move. Second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next is to consider the approval of the selection and pricing for the facilities audit. Approve Walter Robbs to reform the facility conditions assessment 
based upon the scope of work approved by the Board of Education for all Winston-Salem for Scythe County School facilities constructed before 2019. Do move I have to, a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Um, next is to consider the approval of the resolution for sale of Long Shadow Street property. Um, that the resolution be executed for the property sell. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Next is consider approval of the additional funding for the Glen Boiler. Approve the low bid of 393,300 for the Glen High Boiler replacement project. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next is the, at this time we have three items on the consent, consent agenda. First is consider approval of the general personnel report. Consider approval of the November 9th, 2021 Board of Education meeting minutes. Next, consider approval of the November 16, 2021 Board of Education meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve all three? Someone. Second. Okay, second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Um, so I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First, uh, next uh, Tuesday, February 8th of 2022 is the building and grounds policy and regular um, building and grounds and policy and regular meeting of the Board of Education. And as mentioned earlier, January is school board recognition month. And I'd like to personally thank my fellow board members for their service. These last two years have been a testament to not just the educators and the students' abilities to adapt to their constantly changing environments, but also to our school board members who work diligently behind the scenes to make the educational experience the best it can be for our students in a time where normalcy isn't always possible. They are extraordinary people who voluntarily tackle the enormous job of governing our district and do so in a manner that illustrates what it means to be resilient, ready, and relentless. And for all of those that they represent, so thank you so much. It's an honor to serve with each of you all, and you all are awesome. Thank you. So before we begin the section of our meeting in which anyone can comment on anything, let me say to our cable two viewers, Thank you for watching. This will conclude our broadcast. Thank you for joining us on Your School Channel, Table 2.